Yeah, Vahe Gregorian has been a sports columnist for the Kansas City Star and KansasCity.com since 2013. After 25 years with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, if there has been a major sporting event involving a Missouri team over the last three decades, there's a pretty good chance that Vahe was there covering it. It's great to welcome Vahe Gregorian to the Sports Reporters. Vahe, thanks for your time. How are you? Hey, I'm great. It's great to be with you guys, and I loved your uh, intro music, uh, the, the first strains of, uh, I think it was the Bobby Fuller 4 version of I Fought the Law, um, <laughs> which uh, I think will kick off this week just fine. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> what a good perception. That's yeah, right. absolutely. Well, well, hey, the I'm, I'm are in Buffalo. you guys, not me. I, I, <laughs> no, we're, yeah. we're always Go in ahead, trouble, sorry. believe me. <laughs> Well, the Chiefs are in Buffalo for a late afternoon game. Vahe, are, are you there or are you in Kansas City today? I'm not there, and, and it's, it really is it's a, it's a, a, a really interesting question about how we're doing all this these days. This, if, if I'm correct about this, and I think I am, this will be the first time since the Chiefs moved here in 1963 that, that we won't be at one of their games. Um, and in this case, it's a, a combination of things. Um, Sort of, but, but all COVID related. I mean, really, there's a, a puzzling uh, thing to be deciphered about traveling to New York right now and quarantine questions and things like that. And uh, it just got a little complicated, so we, we're, we're not going. I went to the Chiefs game in uh, Los Angeles and in, and in Baltimore. In fact, in Baltimore, I was the only member of the Kansas City media at all that was present. Um, again, COVID restrictions and things like that. The thing that's kind of fascinating is, and I'm taking this farther than you guys want me to probably, but, you know, the interview access points are the same whether you're there or not. And that's kind of the uh, the good and bad and ugly of it all. I mean, we, we everybody that is in the media that's covering this will be on a Zoom call after the game and get to talk to the same four or five people. And that is just so different than what we're used to going into a locker room and getting to talk to, you know, 8, 10, 12 people, depending on the situation, and sometimes, you know, having your own interview. This has to be an altogether different, just so so alien situation to anybody. We had uh, Dana Hughes with us on the air on Friday, and in my total ignorance, I asked him what time he and Mitch Holdis would be taking off for Buffalo, and he said, well, we'll be taking off for Arrowhead Stadium, because that's where we'll do the game, watching it on TV. <laughs> I had no idea that they... They were not present either. And and I'm just curious, does that change from a reporter standpoint, does that change your viewpoint on on how you judge a game and assessments that you might make? I think it's sort of just like anything else is right now. I'm sure it shifts something in, inside your ability to, you know, how you perceive it all. Um, I, you know, being at the game, it, it, let's face it, it just feels more authentic. And you are a little bit limited as, as amazing and, and extensive as the TV coverage can be, you still are limited to what you are being shown instead of what you're able to seek out and watch yourself, whether it's through binoculars or um, you know, casual observation. So it just, it just frames it differently. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that you're uh, you're really called <laughs> you're really called to pay attention during the broadcast, and your, your thoughts don't drift away like they might if you're joking around with a guy next year, or, or you say, "Hey, did you see that?" And I uh, just hope you get the replay because you're, you're you've got to be lasered in. Um, so what we've been doing is sort of a, a compromise is that uh, Blair Kirkoff, um, and I know you know of his, uh, sure. I know you know him, and I know you know what a wonderful guy and, and great colleague he is. We typically have gone into the star and uh, set up shop in there, nicely distanced uh, with one big TV and able to kind of just, you know, keep each other, uh, um, uh, not keep each other focused, but, you know, kind of keep conversation about the game going and, and share observations. It really is a, a healthy thing that we think to do to, and keep that kind of same energy. And uh, as after every game, you know, we've got five or six people writing, so we are communicating a lot through our Slack channel or texting and trying to make sure we know who's doing what. It's, it's different. To go back to your original question, that it's different, but I think like we are all seeing in so many different facets of our lives, you are just um, looking to do it and adjust and make the best of it. 
Have I had the same routine during the week, you know, going out to a practice? Well, I guess you don't, is practice even open to anybody right now? Is it all Zoom during the week as well? It's practice uh, for about, I think, six reporters who kind of have to get, I think they still get screened regularly, and they don't get anywhere near players anyway, but and it's only about a 45-minute period or half-hour period of practice that's open. I think it's kind of when they, you know, make sure they, <laughs> you see what they uh, want you to see and nothing more. Um, but at least you can see who's, who's sort of part of what, uh, you know, how they're lining up in terms of, uh, um, you know, depth chart and so, things like that. But, then, yeah, that, that's the whole thing, too. The rest of it does become a, a, a Zoom call. Um, so, you know, you're left with uh, wanting to make sure you know, your questions are sharpened because you know everybody's watching, and, uh, but you're also sharing everything. And, and, you know, we benefit from that, but also you just – there's no exclusivity, and, and it, it is just kind of – I'm not really – I don't really want to make that sound like a complaint. My dogs are complaining, but, um, <laughs> but it's but – it's, 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 um, it's just – it. you've got to sort of accept what the situation is. That's that is like, like, number I'm, doing, one, the, like I'm doing right now, and you guys are putting up with right now. <laughs> no, Havens, we we all have the animals too. Come on, <laughs> this is great. I love it, uh, and and I also love your description of you see what they want you to see, and that's pulling no punches, folks, because some of these things are orchestrated for just exactly how the. Uh, team or the club or whatever the circumstance might be wants the reporters to report on because there are so many variables that do occur otherwise when you uh, when you are covering a game and able to do it in person uh, well let, let me let me rephrase that because we're in such a unique situation now are you of the opinion this is subjective on your part that this is going to be the only time that we ever go through a mess like this that it will be back to normal next year do you have any reason to be optimistic about that well it's really in my mind a little bit of a coin toss in terms of in my own perspective on I'm, I'm feeling like I just be guessing I do remember this I remember it being March and I remember thinking boy this is going to be a couple of weeks um, and then uh, yeah. I remember thinking, boy, I guess it's going to be a couple months. And one of my uh, colleagues, Sam McDowell, um, I remember him saying at the time, he'd been doing a lot of reading, and he said, you know, I think you need to, we need to all look at this a little differently. This is probably going to go into next year. And I, I, I think I thought, well, he's just sort of uh, overstating it, and, and, and yet clearly that's what it is. And I don't know that. I feel like our arms are around it yet. Um, so I do wonder if, let's just say for argument's sake, if the rescheduled Olympics uh, for next summer will will go off as fully intended. Um, I guess it, it's, it's hard for me to think that baseball will start quite right, that spring training is going to be all set as we used to know it. Um, maybe I feel like it's reasonable to hope for next fall football is – is, is the same uh, as we're used to. I, the other thing that, and I'm sure this has occurred to you guys in many different ways, whether it's through sports or life, I, you do wonder what kinds of things will just be different even when it's um, sure. safe to come outside again. And I, I probably just based on our conversation earlier or me rambling on, I mean, I, I can tell that I'm sort of focused on, okay, do, what will our access points be? Because you know, really, a lot of the goal in what we do is to take people where they don't get to go, um, and that's just much harder to do when you you you're not actually within yourself. You know, why you covered uh, championship teams in baseball, uh, Super Bowl champions, also Olympic games, uh, ten Olympic games. How, do you have a uh, uh, something that ranks at the top of the list, or how do you balance those many? Uh, things that you've covered over the years as uh, your, maybe your favorite? Gosh, you know, that is, that is really hard to, to describe or to even know. I think that in my mind, I, I sort of keep track of eight, ten events that I, I sort of felt like were out of body when, when you were observing them. And um, I think for me, probably... Uh, all of what happened in 2014 and 2015 with the Royals seems the most 
most like that in the sense of just your your imagination being just so so opened up to a, a, such a bad tradition for so long, and and then also the way it engulfed the city. I mean, a city that had had little joy in sports for decades. I mean, I, I got here in 2013. Chiefs hadn't won a playoff game in 20 years. The Royals hadn't been in the playoffs in 28 years. Um, it was a city that was kind of just down on itself, at least in terms of sports. And we know there's a little link between how you look at yourself through sports and what you what you you know your pride is a little link. And um, it just was uh, euphoric in so many ways. So I've been lucky to experience you know glimpses of that, whether it's uh, with people I've covered that. Uh, I saw win a gold medal or a silver medal, and and you sort of feel like that too because you, you've you've known them a little bit. I mean, I don't mean somebody like Michael Phelps that you don't really know, but guys like Christian Cantwell or Sammy Henson that were they were silver medalists, and and you sort of were along with them for the journey because you knew who they were and you spent time with them. So so that's anyway. I, I, but I do put the royal thing. The 2014, 2015 Royal stuff is at really right near the top of my list. And you were in uh, you were in St. Louis, of course, during some of the glory years of the the Cardinals and the uh, the St. Louis Rams, as far as that's concerned. So covering championship events of that nature, that uh, that really fit into your scheme of things. Was there a difference between the way that the uh, sports championships enveloped St. Louis and the way it enveloped Kansas City? Well, one thing, I tell my uh, Cardinal fan friends this all the time, and I'm sure you guys can appreciate it, that when the Royals just got to the World Series in 2014 and let alone when they won in 2015, that was, there was something going on there that no Cardinal fan could really appreciate. You, you guys might know this better than I do off the top of my head, but certainly in our lifetimes, I think the longest the Cardinals had ever gone without being in the World Series was from 68 to 82, maybe. That's um, I that's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. So think about that. It's just, and, and also routinely being in contention. So this, this becomes a team that's not even been in the playoffs that won it. So I think the Cardinal fan, I hate to say spoiled, that's not really right, but has certainly had reason to have expectations. The franchise has kept it at that at that level for so long, but I think there's a, just an appreciation level that was pretty cool and different um, out of Royals fans at that point. You know, the other thing is kind of funny. I, I uh, te- this is what I tease my Cardinal fan friends about. So if the Royals, I think I'm doing the math right here. If the Royals are the next team to win the World Series between the two, they will have won as many World Series since their inception as the Cardinals have. Um, three. So I think the Cardinals have won <laughs> three right. since, since 68. Um, so that's just sort of a, a fun point to, uh, to bring up, and it probably will be immaterial. It seems like the Cardinals are a little better girded right now, although I'm excited about the Royals' future. I think there's a lot of, a lot of pretty cool stuff bubbling up here. Well, you wouldn't know this, but like you, I'm also a Philadelphia area a native from Southern hey. New Jersey. Uh, you're you're from Swarthmore, and I'm from over in Haddonfield, over on the other side of the uh, of the Delaware River. But all right, no, I didn't know that. I'm a lot older than you are, which also figures into the mix. Coming from that area. We know what it's like to be without championship teams for many, many, many years. <laughs> well, you, you're darn right, and you you were probably a little bit more in the, uh, uh, shall we say, the silent time than than even I was. But the one thing that um, I'll tell you this: we moved to Philadelphia area seventy one, seventy two. We had lived in Texas. And this is fresh in my mind because I was just talking about it with Blair Kirkhoff on a, a podcast we did. So, you know, this is a time in Philadelphia sports where the Sixers are about to go 9-73. and 73. Um, <laughs> The Phillies, I think the Eagles were 4-10. and 10. The Phillies lost 103 games, I think. Um, but there were the Philadelphia Flyers. And 
because of that, as the Flyers, you know, in, in the next year or two, win back-to-back Stanley Cups, mm-hmm. um, that really kept to the imagination of a, of a kid growing up in the area at the time. Although, I'll tell you this, I, I, I listened to very faithfully to every one of those Sixers broadcasts that I could um, during that year when they won nine games. I just kind of kind of enjoyed it. So you're right, though, Ned. You come to it with that underdog mentality like, all right, we want to see – we we know one day there'll be a change, and 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 I'll 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 just keep going. Uh, but we that, hope that guys we're going to be around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. That's right. Was my uh, I, I, I was already out here in in Missouri at the time. The Sixers were so miserably poor, nine and seventy three. Was my buddy Bill Campbell still doing the uh, the play by play? He was. Then? He mm-hmm. was. Uh, and I, I can I I can hear his voice in my mind's eye right now as 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 you say that and you know uh, let's see Steve Mix uh, anytime he'd make a shot he'd say Mix makes <laughs> uh, and Action Dog Carter that. and all these yeah anyway I'm going on and on but that that's what I do. Very good, sir. Vi, you've uh, covered some colorful characters over the years. Uh, Andy Reid. And Ned Yost are two guys in recent years that uh, certainly have their unique ways of doing things and and so forth. Could tell us about what those guys are like to to interact with. Yeah, for sure. First of all, I, let, let's go with Andy first. You know, I go I go a ways back with Andy. When I was covering University of Missouri football, he was an assistant coach, and you guys will both appreciate this. That was an era when. You know, the assistant coach was a guy who, if he was a personable guy, he would walk by and you'd stop and talk for a while. And it just it wouldn't really be an interview. You'd just chat. And it wasn't just me or the other guys, too. And Andy was very amiable and uh, really enjoyed talking to him. And, and you could see his personality. And so I kind of, in a tangential way, I guess, kept up with him a little over the years. I went to do a story on him when he was with the Eagles and, you know, spent time in his office, and we had some intermittent contact. And um, and so I've really enjoyed seeing, you know, following his career arc. And I enjoy, I enjoy him a lot here. You know, we know him to be close to the best guy publicly, especially during, during the season where he's, you know, he's just, he once in a while thinks, okay, I'm going to give them a little candy, but mostly I'm just, I'm just keeping everything under wraps. Um, and it, you know, it's the nature of the beast in the NFL, but, but I'll tell you what, Andy is a prince of a person, and I know this through things I've witnessed him doing with other people, but a lot through what other people have told me about the things he'll do for people behind the scenes and the way he cares about people, and that sort of all comes together in, in you know, the way you saw people want to see Andy win the Super Bowl last year, people who had played for him, people around the league. You know, he's, he's very... Uh, um, immersed in, in, in the lives of the people that he's come in contact with. So, so that's been pretty neat. And, and, and I, I think it portends that Andy has a chance for more ahead because so much of what he does is not just his genius as an offensive schemer, but, but based on his relationships and, and how people look at him. Um, Ned was just, to me, a fascinating guy. I, you know, I got here, and, and it seemed like he was just in combat with everybody all the time. And I remember he had some line about, you know, they were, he was being challenged and why he uh, kept playing Moustakas. And he had this line about that there's, you know, there's no third base tree. And um, he he really got shredded for that line. And I remember thinking, because I had a fresh canvas, right, I got here, I was like, that's a pretty funny line. It's kind of true. He can't. It, it, it's a different kind of way to say it. But long, long and short of it with Ned, you had to get used to his demeanor, and that, that was the curmudgeonly old baseball guy. Um, and so you knew anytime you asked Ned a question, he was going to say no or try to shoot you down or you know just give you a little jab no matter what first. But that kind of if he absorbed the first blow, he'd eventually give you, give you a, a, a good answer to what you were looking for. <laughs> So you just kind of had to wait out Ned and, and understand him a little bit. I really came to enjoy him. Had some nice talks with him over the years about, you know, hard things in his life, about the, the death of his father in an accident and some things like that. So I felt like I came to really appreciate Ned. 
last last thing about all these guys is that um, imagine having to talk to people. Let's see, Ned would be, all these guys are typically three times a day during the season for 162 games you're being interviewed and, you know, multiple times in spring training. You're probably given 1,000 interviews a year. I just, <laughs> I try to remind myself to be sympathetic to that when you feel like maybe a guy's a little crusty one day. Um, but then the very last thing I do want to say about that is just this. It has been, as much as I enjoyed Ned, it's been very refreshing to deal with Mike Matheny, who um, is really it, it, it expansive in his answers. He's obviously very smart. Um, he, he just he's more patient than Ned, and at least in terms of dealing with us uh, through this first year. So it becomes a much less kind of contentious back and forth where you have to feel like your armor's on when you're when you're talking to him. I mean, you can just kind of enjoy the conversation on, on its face a little easier. Vahe. Uh... Before we let you go, uh, what do we look for tonight on the Chiefs game after after having a tough one last time out? Do you expect a sharp performance? Well, I do, and, and and yet, you know, it's funny. You think about, well, the Chiefs will be motivated after what happened last time. Well, I mean, the Bills have a little point of pride here after the way they lost their last game, and it's funny. It, it, you know, they were going to be, we are looking at it as possibly two undefeated teams coming into it. Um I think we we saw the Chiefs exposed. Uh, some of their vulnerabilities were exposed last game out. But I also think that the Chiefs at their best are still the, the team to beat. And I think they'll be they'll be much closer to their best tonight. I, I I look for them to win and maybe maybe slide into a double digit win, something like a thirty one to twenty thing, with probably you know a couple minutes left with it being a one score game. But I I I think they'll I think they'll win this game and and. Uh, um, that's that's just what I expect. In the overall scheme of things and watching the Chiefs on an almost daily basis, do you feel like they are as good or better than last year's Super Bowl team? Well, I think there's a chance they're better. I, I don't think they're not as good. Um, and the reason I say that is simply because we were, gosh, it took seven, eight, it took almost ten weeks in the last season before you felt like, okay, the defense will be an asset, not a problem, and you still worried even then. I think by and large this season we felt like, all right, it's a group that has played together for a year. It's got some dynamic parts. Um, it, 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 you know, it's absorbed a new scheme uh, with the new coach, Spagnolo. Now, last, last week was you know, sort of cause for, for, for pause on that, but, but basically they've been pretty good for a while. Um, I think I think we'll come to see last week as an exception. They have some stuff to clean up, but I think because I already think their defense is basically established, and because their offense um, has more to it now, um, I think I think they'll 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 ultimately be a better team. Um, and I think we need to just realize there's going to be some fluctuation early in any NFL season, but especially this one where. The off season was so disjointed, um, and there. And, and look, teams are going to be incentivized to play them, and teams are going to learn, have learned more and more about what they want to do to try to contain the homes. So there'll be some back and forth. But I think if you're if you're really just focused on what they are and who they have, I think they are a, they are at least the same team and can be a better team. Very optimistic remarks from Vahe Gregorian from the Kansas City Star, and both Lyndall and I are extremely appreciative of your taking time to visit with us. Thank you very much, and hopefully we can do this again sometime with your permission. Oh, uh, well, glad to anytime. I'm really glad you guys uh, were able to uh, reach out, and uh, thanks for putting up with the dogs. Um, <laughs> they, uh, they're a little out of their morning routine, and, and uh, you know you know what happens then. Yes, we do. <laughs> Thanks, Bahe, very much. Bahe, very much. Okay, guys, thank you again. All right. Thank you, sir.